Hello folks, it's Mr Neil here and in this video I'm going to review the Higher Computing Science Computer Systems Unit. This unit is broke up of four main areas. Data representation, computer structure, environmental impact, security risks and precautions. You will find the full specification for the Computer Systems Unit within the Higher Computing Science course specification which is available on the SQA website. From National 5 you should recall how we store positive whole numbers or integers in binary. Here on the left we have the process of converting from decimal to binary and on the right the process from binary to decimal. To figure out the range of numbers that can be stored within a set number of bits we use the formula 2 to the power n minus 1 where n is the number of bits that are being used. So if 8 bits are used to store a number then we can store 2 to the power 8 minus 1 numbers which is 255. At higher we also need to know how we store negative whole numbers in binary. The system most used to represent and handle negative numbers in binary is 2's complement. There are three steps to finding the 2's complement of a number. So let's take the example minus 116. We start by finding the positive value for 116. We then flip that number. So every 0 becomes a 1 and every 1 becomes a 0. And lastly we add 1 to the answer. It is necessary to start at the right hand side of the number. If the number on the right is a 1, then we move to the next number. And we keep moving from right to left to find a 0. So in this case, we start at 1 and we keep moving to 4 where we find a 0. This means that this value would now become a 1 and all values to the right of that would be changed to a 0. As 2 plus 1 plus an additional 1 equals 4. So that's a process of converting a negative integer to binary using 2's complement. Let's look at the reverse of that. How do we convert a binary number to find its negative value? So in this case, we're going to look at the number 1000011100. So we start with a minus 128 and we add to that the other values. So minus 128 plus 8 plus 4 gives us the answer minus 116. When we're working with 2's complement, the first value, 128, will always be 1. And that's the indication that the number is a negative number. Because with 2's complement, we are using 8 bits to store both positive and negative numbers. The range of numbers that we can store in 8 bits is reduced. So with 2's complement, the lowest value that can be represented with 8 bits is minus 128. And the highest value is 127. Moving now on to real numbers. These are numbers that include fractions or values after the decimal point. For example, 2.342 is a real number. This type of number is also known as a floating point number, or in maths and science you may have heard it referred to as scientific notation. All floating point numbers are stored using a mantissa and exponent. The size of the mantissa increases the precision or accuracy of the number and the size of the exponent increases the range of the number. When we're storing binary numbers in floating point representation, there are three parts. The sign part is a single bit and it indicates whether the number is positive or negative. The exponent is a power of 2 stored using 2's complement notation because it can be positive or negative. And the mantissa is the positive binary fraction. So here we have an example 01101, 011. So we know looking at the sign bit that this is a positive number. So we convert that to be 0 0.1101 times 2 to the power 3 because this exponent here is 3. If we then move the decimal place to take it out of floating point representation, we get 0110.1. Here's another example. In this case, the sign bit is 1, so it's a negative number. Our exponent also starts with 1. So from 2's complement, we know that this will be a negative number. So we can say that this number is minus 0.1101 times 2 to the minus 3. And we know that this here is minus 3 because we take minus 4 and we add 1 to it to get minus 3. And this gives us the answer minus 0 0.001101 when we take it out of floating point representation. From National 5 you recall that characters can also be represented in binary. Characters are usually grouped together in a character set and a character set includes alphanumerical characters, symbols and control characters. 
The character set that we discussed at National 5 is Extended ASCII, which uses 8 bits for each character, which means it can represent 256 different characters. However, there are more than 256 different characters across all languages in the world. So this is where Unicode comes in. Unicode uses 16 bits to represent each character, and this means that Unicode can represent 65,536 different characters including those from the Arabic alphabet, the Japanese alphabet, and many other languages, including emojis. Move on on now to look at bitmap graphics. As you know, a bitmap graphic stores data about every single pixel in an image. This can lead to several advantages. Because we are storing the details of individual pixels, they can look extremely realistic, and we can edit down to the pixel level. However, because we store the pixels, if we make the image bigger, then the image will become pixelated. And because we're storing the details of every single pixel within an image, the file sizes can be quite large. Vector graphics are a type of graphic that stores the image as a collection of objects, including rectangles, ellipses, polygons and lines, and attributes about these objects, for example its coordinates, its length, breadth, fill colour. Because we are storing the details about the objects within the picture, it allows the picture to be increased in size and the quality kept. And it also means that we can go and edit the image at object level. And because it's storing the information about the objects and how they are created, the file sizes are relatively small. However, because we are storing details about the objects, it is very difficult to create realistic images. And also vector graphic, how it looks depends on the hardware and software that is being used to render the image. Now moving on to look at the computer structure. The central processing unit is the brain of the computer. It is responsible for carrying out the fetch execute cycle. This involves accessing memory locations to read and write data either before or after execution by the processor. Most modern processors will have more than one core. This means that there are actually multiple cores within the CPU. The more cores present within the CPU, it means the greater number of tasks that can be processed simultaneously. At National 5, when we looked at the components inside of a processor, you may have seen a diagram similar to this, where we identified the main components within a processor are the control unit, the arithmetic logic unit, and the registers. And at National 5, we said that registers are temporary storage areas in the processor which can be used to hold information. At higher, we distinguished between different types of registers. So this is a more realistic diagram. Within the processor, there can be up to five different registers. The program counter, which stores the address of the next instruction to be fetched. The memory address register stores the address of the memory location where data is to be read from or written to. The accumulator stores the results of any arithmetic and logical operations. The memory data register holds data that is either to be passed to the data bus or data that has been received from the data bus. And the instruction register is the current instruction being decoded or executed. The connection between the processor and main memory are called buses. And there are three different buses. The address bus identifies the address of the location and memory that is to be read from or written to. The data bus will transfer data to and from the address that is held in the address bus. The amount of data that can be carried across a data bus depends on the word size. This describes the width of a data bus. Most modern processors will usually have a word size of 64 lines, allowing for 64 bits to be transferred along the address bus each cycle. And the last bus that manages the others is the control bus. Earlier we said that the processor is responsible for the fetch execute cycle. And the fetch execute cycle is a set of steps that the processor takes when reading and executing instructions. There are two main operations that a processor will perform a memory read operation and a memory write operation. With a memory read operation, the memory address register sets up the address bus with the relevant memory location to be read from. The control bus read line is then activated. The content of the address held on the address bus are placed onto the data bus and then the data bus transfers the data from memory to the memory data register. Looking at now a write operation. The memory address register sets up the address bus with the relevant memory location to be read from. The memory data register passes the data to be written to to the data bus. The control bus write line is then activated. The data bus transfers the data to the memory location specified by the address bus.
So when we're talking about modern computing, we need to take into consideration the factors that may affect the performance of our computer system. There are four different factors that we can consider. Firstly, looking at the number of cores. As we know, a CPU can contain one or more cores. Each core will have its own control unit, ALU and registers. CPUs with multiple cores have more power to run multiple programs at the same time. We know that the data bus is a set of parallel lines that transport data between the processor and memory. By increasing the width of the data bus from 32 to 64 bits, the computer can transfer twice as much information at once and therefore increasing the performance of our computer system. Cache is a small amount of memory which is part of the CPU. It's closer to the CPU than RAM. A low access in RAM is faster than retrieving data from the hard disk. Processor performance can be improved by using cache memory. Cache is a faster kind of memory which stores copies of data from frequently used memory locations. The more cache there is, the more data that can be stored close to the CPU. The clock speed is how fast a CPU can run. This is measured in megahertz or gigahertz and corresponds with how many instructions the CPU can deal with in a second. A 2 gigahertz CPU performs 2 billion cycles a second. Let's now look at environmental impact. At higher, when we're talking about environmental impact, we look at how intelligent systems can be used to reduce energy use and emission as concerns over global warming grows. An intelligent system is a machine which has the ability to perform tasks that would require intelligence if they were performed by a human. Let's have a look at a couple of different intelligent systems. Smart heating systems, for example Nest or Hive, can make several intelligent decisions about your heating. For example, is your home occupied or not? Motion sensors or GPS data from your smartphone can feed into the system so that heating is reduced when you're not at home. Most smart heating systems can be connected to the internet, allowing the user to manually adjust them via a smartphone app regardless of where in the world they are. There are a number of different intelligent systems that can be used to aid traffic flow. Firstly, variable speed limits. The speed limit can be raised and lowered automatically by sensors input as well as historic data or they can be manually controlled. The aim of variable speed limits is to reduce queuing so that cars are not accelerating, decelerating and then idling repeatedly. Traffic data in satnavs can be updated real time and this means that the drivers in satnavs can adapt the route that they have taken to the traffic conditions. Increased use of more intelligent satnav systems help to reduce congestion and journey time. Within modern vehicles, there are a number of several intelligent systems that can be used to help reduce fuel consumption and emissions. For example, start-stop technology is where the engine will automatically stop running when the car is not moving. Sensors in the clutch will then detect when the driver goes to move off and start the engine in a millisecond. This is all controlled and monitored by an intelligent system that can differentiate between brief pauses and normal driving and having to stop for a period of time, for example at traffic lights. Many cars now make use of electronic power from a battery alongside traditional engines. This hybrid technology can be used to lower vehicle emissions to benefit the environment. Hybrid vehicles require complex intelligent systems to be constantly monitoring vehicle movement and driver actions through a series of sensors. Typically, the system will run the car on electronic only mode at low speeds and use the normal engine for higher speeds. Moving on now to look at security risks and precautions. The Computer Misuse Act 1990 recognises the following as offences. Unauthorised access to computer material. Unauthorised access with the intent to commit or facilitate further crime unauthorised modification of computer material and making, supplying or obtaining anything which can be used in computer misuse offences. This means writing, supplying or obtaining any malicious applications, for example viruses, worms or trojans, that will enable you to get unauthorised access onto a computer system. A cookie is a small data file created when you access a website. These can be used to store your personal preferences or login details so that you don't need to re-enter them. Tracking cookies are used to gather information. They can also help target personalised ads. Most are not harmful, however programmers can set up tracking cookies to send them your username and personal details without you knowing. Denial of service attacks are designed to make services inaccessible. Denial of service attacks can range in duration and may target more than one site or system at a time. When a service is under attack from a DOS attack, the performance will be slowed down or they may be completely unaccessible to the user. 
The effect of a DOS attack means that genuine users will be unable to access resources and there is the potential that the business may not be able to operate and therefore causing reputational damage or customers moving on to a competitor. The results of a DOS attack means that a company may lose money and that there may be an increase in labour costs for dealing with a DOS attack. For example, specialist network engineers may be needed to recover from the DOS attack. There are a range of different kinds of DOS attack. In a bandwidth consumption attack, floods of requests fill the connection up to its limits so that no other requests can get through. The effect only lasts as long as the attack is maintained. In a resource starvation attack, requests each use a little bit of other resources like disk space until the server runs out and is no longer able to function correctly. Domain name service attacks attack the service that routes internet traffic through the internet so can impact multiple websites at once. There are several reasons why a DOS attack may be carried out. It may be carried out for malicious reasons, where individuals think it's a good idea or fun to bring down an organisation's network. For personal reasons, this could be a disgruntled employee who bears a grudge and can see a DOS attack as revenge against an employer. Or political. Sometimes DOS attacks can be politically motivated, such as an attack on a government network or to bring down a rival company in a business. Encryption takes place in many situations where data is being transmitted over an internet connection. Encryption is the process of encoding data using encryption keys. One method of encrypting data is public key encryption or asynchronous encryption. Public key encryption uses two keys to encrypt data. The public key is known by everyone and is used to encrypt the message. The private key is known only by the recipient and is used to decrypt the message. Digital certificates become the equivalent of an electronic passport. It allows individuals or companies to feel secure in exchanging information as they each know the identity of the other party. A digital certificate is exceptionally hard to forge and can be trusted as it will have been issued by a trusted agency. Similarly, a digital signature is an electronic signature that can be used to authenticate the identity of a sender of a message or the signer of a document and can be used to ensure that the original content of the message or document has not been tampered with. In this video, I have reviewed the Computer Systems Unit from the Higher Computing Science course. If there are any aspects of this unit that you're not sure of, then I recommend that you undertake further study. When you're studying, please utilise all the resources available to you. These could be the resources from your own classroom teacher or those available on the SQA, BBC Bite Size and Scholar websites.